Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, Facebook Live event. Uh, my name is Ida Chelli, and I'm here with our uh, tax expert, Jerry Vitaratis. This is our last Facebook Live for this tax season. So, Jerry, do you want to remind us of the tax deadline? Sure. So, uh, so the deadline, so the deadline uh, has not changed. Okay, from uh, uh, from last year. Okay, so it's going to be April thirtieth. All right. So, so the deadline's going to be on April thirtieth. Uh, remember that uh, the government has not extended, unfortunately. Uh, but what they have done is given an interest holiday for those. Uh, for those of you who have received COVID benefits and, and have a balance owing at the end of the year, okay, when, you're, when you're filing your tax return. So there's an interest holiday until April 30th. However, there is no penalty holiday, meaning that you absolutely have to file your return. And if you owe money and you don't file by uh, tomorrow, by midnight, by midnight tomorrow, uh, then uh, 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 you know penalties will apply, which are stiff. We're talking about 5% on the balance owing the minute you are late. And then it is 1% for every month that you have not filed your tax return. Okay. So make sure that you file it on time. Even if you can't pay for those of you who received COVID benefits uh, and you have a balance only, remember that you basically have a year. Okay, to pay the government back till April 30th of 2022, uh, because there is no interest charged on your balance only. However, just just one province that's waiving the uh, penalty for late filing this this time. Yeah, it's uh, basically uh, it's it's Quebec. So for those of you who are required to file a Quebec return, uh, it, it, the deadline hasn't really changed officially, actually. Uh, okay. But what they've done is that they basically they're going to turn a blind eye until May 30th. That's essentially what they've told everybody. So if if it just so happens that you're not able to uh, uh, to file by April 30th, then for Quebec you're okay as far as your Quebec tax return only, not the, not your federal return, but your Quebec tax return. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll turn a blind eye till May 30th, essentially. But again, I mean, if you're if you have to file your federal by by April 30th, you know, go ahead and do the You same may as well. Yeah. I mean, you may as well do the same thing. And, and, and with you file, we produce both at the same time, right? So, so there's really no reason to uh, to delay. There's really no reason to wait. All right. Uh, we do have a question from Edward. All right. Uh, he said, uh, if you have filed already but forgot to include a slip, can we refile using you file? Yes. Uh, the answer is you can refile using you file. You file, I believe you go three years back, right? Uh, right. Ida? I think you can yes. even up, yes. up to three years back. So yes, you can, uh, you can simply trigger refile through the software and you could, you could just, you know, e-file, uh, just submit a second return. Okay? However, um, he, the, the, the file must be uh, assessed the first time around, right? Yes, absolutely. So you must have a notice of assessment already emitted. Uh, now, remember that if this is an official government slip, so for example, if it's a T5 slip or T4 slip, remember that the government has these in their records, right? Uh, so chances are the government has already taken into account that slip and has already reassessed you, okay? So it's very good odds that the government has already done that, mm -hmm. okay? But if you notice that when you get your assessment that the government has not seen that slip that you're missing, then absolutely go ahead and refile your tax return uh, with a CRA because once you get your assessment, you're ready to go. You're ready, okay. you're ready to be to refile. So the, therefore, if the government made the corrections, it doesn't need to refile. Yeah. Um, okay. What are the changes for this year? So the changes for this year, the big one is essentially, uh, we're talking about home office expenses. Okay. So that's the big one essentially. So we're talking about, uh, you know, expenses that are related to your home office. If you're required to work from home, like me and you right now, mm -hmm. uh, Ida, we're, we're both working from home right now. Uh, so if you're required to work from home, uh, then, uh, you are in this case entitled, uh, to deduct home office expenses. So the government gives you two options. Okay. So, First of all, home office expenses is nothing new. It's not a new concept, okay? People were able to deduct this before. It's just that this year, more people will be eligible for it, whereas before, it was a very small minority of taxpayers that were eligible. Now, a lot of us are, including you and me. We're newly eligible for exactly. home office expenses as well, right? So the government this year is giving two options, okay? Uh, the first one is what's called the flat rate method where uh, if you're required to work from home for at least four consecutive weeks during 2020, you can deduct $2 per day for every work day that you worked at home. Okay. There is a cap to that deduction, which is $400. So you are capped at 400. Okay. Uh, and again, it's $2 per day. No administrative requirements uh, are, there's no administrative requirements, meaning that uh, the, the, the government is not going to ask you for any receipts. They're not going to ask you any, for any proof, uh, for any corroborative, uh, corroborative document 
uh, from your employer, meaning, you know, a form that they sign off on uh, stating that you were uh, you're required to work from home. So none of these uh, requirements uh, uh, would be uh, asked of you by the CRA if you choose the flat rate method, okay? But you are capped at $400 as a maximum deduction. All right, now there is the old method, uh, which still exists, which now the government calls the detailed method. And this is where you are, you are, you are actually deduct, you're deducting actual expenses. Okay, so you're actually grabbing uh, actual expenses like rent, like heating, electricity, uh, uh, what's called, uh, you know, uh, office supplies like, uh, you know, pens, papers, folders, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and, 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 uh, and so you're deducting the, your, the expenses you actually paid on those amounts. However, remember that uh, you are pro, you have to prorate that claim based on the square footage of your home office vis-a-vis the rest of your home. You know, so you have to do that calculation. So take the square footage of your home office divided by the square footage the square footage of uh, of your home, whatever percentage you get, that's the percentage you're allowed to claim on those expenses. Okay, that's essentially uh, uh, what's called. So that that's that's the big one. The other smaller ones, you've got the Canada Training Credit is another one uh, that we were starting to accumulate a limit last year. So this is a new refundable credit based on your tuition fees, where you can claim up to half of your tuition fees as a refundable credit. Or, or the lesser of half of your uh, tuition fees, or um, uh, or in this case, the limit that you've accumulated up until this point, which is $250 since last year. And the last one, uh, I guess, as far as changes, is the digital news subscription expense credit. Uh, so that's essentially if you have signed up. So very simple, uh, if you have a digital subscription to a newspaper, okay, be it, for example, let's say Global Mail or your local paper, like us here, we're in Montreal. So it'd be the Montreal Gazette, for example, or National Post, uh, then uh, you can claim a, a non-refundable tax credit up to five hundred dollars of expense on that credit. So those are those are the changes. Those are the basic changes on the return. All right. Um, we have a question from Anya. Actually, mm -hmm. she has a two-part question. Mm -hmm. uh, she wants to know if she needs to redo or readjust their taxes. How should she go about it? Okay. So you could do. Uh, uh, so we, uh, you know, the first question, the the first answer that we had was which was the refile option. That's one way of doing it. So you could actually just you know make the changes to your file after you've been assessed and then retransmit your return uh, to the CRA. Okay. So that's one way of doing it. The other way is to an adjustment. And that, uh, you know, we, we have the adjustment form in UFILE, but what I recommend to everybody, and I, and I did this in the last, uh, in the last uh, Facebook Live that we gave, uh, what I would recommend to everybody is uh, go through the My Account portal of the CRA. It is child's play to sign up with them, uh, and you could do an adjustment directly on, uh, on that website. And it's done pretty quickly. It's assessed pretty quickly as well. So those are, uh, so those are the options that you have. And I think we were going to go to the second part, right, for Anya? Yes, the second part. She's asking, um, what does it mean if I have unused tuition tax uh, from a previous year? I think it's tuition fees, actually. Yeah, tuition fees. So that, that's good news for you, Anya. What that means is uh, you've got a tax credit that you can use now uh, on your tax return. So so tuition is uh, is one of the credits that you could actually bank, Okay, what, what I call bank. So essentially, when you don't need that tuition credit, uh, you can actually save it for a, a following year where you can use it when you need it. And that's what your tuition fee carry forward is. Usually you find these... Uh, carry forward amounts on your notice of assessment. So that's the result of your return with the CRA and with Revenue Quebec, if you are in Quebec. Uh, and uh, you can find them also in the My Account portal of the CRA. That's another place you can find these carry forwards as well. So you can grab those amounts, plug them into UFILE. UFILE has a box within the tuition fee uh, claim where you can plug in your unused amounts and then you can claim that credit and lower your tax bill. That's essentially what you can do. And that's great news, actually. If you have unused, that means that you, you have a credit now that you can use to lower your taxes. Okay, our next question is from William. Perfect, yeah. He said he printed the federal return, uh, the portion of, from you file. Is it okay to send this printout to the CRA? Yes, 
Yes, it's fine. Just make sure that you've got uh, what's called the condensed return that's with it. Okay. And make sure you attach your receipts with it as well. Okay. So make sure that you do that or you and your slips. Okay. So there's a, so every slip that you get, you get a, a copy for the government and a copy for yourself for your own records. So make sure you cut those slips, put the government copy, attach it to uh, the federal uh, return. I believe we also have an assembly instruction page as well. I would suggest you go to that page in UFAL and it's going to explain to you exactly how to assemble those pages. Okay. And at that point, and remember to attach your receipts and your slips, remember to do that and to mail it in. Or what I would strongly recommend is electronically transmitting the return. Okay. Going by net file. It's quick. It's easy. There's no special requirements. Uh, there's no special requirements in order to be, to transmit and you could do it right away. And the government gets it right away and they'll process your return much faster. It usually takes within five business days, they'll process your return. Well, if you mail it, it could take 10 to 12 weeks before they actually process your return. So I strongly urge you to go through that. If not, if you absolutely want to mail it, go to the assembly instructions and follow what UFAL tells you. All right. The next question is from Dustin. Uh, is my 20 year old who is living away from home and attending university a full time dependent? Okay. So they might not be a dependent. They're not going to be independent in the sense of eligible dependent of that credit because they're too old uh, and they're not living with you. Okay. So you wouldn't meet that. However, it does not, uh, uh, what they can do for you is transfer any unused tuition fees to you. They can still do that even if they're not living with you. Okay. So, so, so what I would recommend is I would recommend that you still have the file attached to yours, even if they're not living with you and they're not theoretically dependent on you. And then what's going to happen is if there's any excess tuition fees that you're, that you're, it's, um, uh, that your 20 year old in this case doesn't say son or daughter. So that your 20 year old, if, if your 20 year old has any excess tuition fees uh, in this case, uh, then you can simply, uh, the U file will simply transfer over that excess amount uh, to your file. Okay. Uh, Jeff, we, that's a more of a technical issue. We won't be able to answer that here. So I will get back to you on that. Uh, Tony, thank you for the comments. Um, Okay, so, and Dustin also asking you and if his income is RESP money, is that income for him? And is our, yes, that is income. Yes, that is income for him. Uh, so when he withdraws from the RESP, it's income for him, but <coughs> excuse me, theoretically, uh, your, your, your 20 year old should not have a lot of income on their tax return. Okay. So therefore, uh, in that case, in that case, uh, it won't be that taxable on their return. That's the purpose of the RESP, right? That's basically the concept of it. Okay. Is the fact that, um, you make the contributions, they're not deductible, but when your son, your son or daughter pulls them out, uh, it, you know, they're not, they're not being taxed that much anyways. Okay. The next question is for, uh, Farhan. Okay. Okay. If someone, if someone just manages their personal investment portfolio and is not employed nor has a business, what should they indicate on the form T1135, self-employed or not self-employed? Mm -hmm. The confusion uh, arises because not employed or he's not a business owner, then what? how would he do and how would the CRA see it? Okay. So you're not self-employed in this case. You're not, you're not considered self-employed in this case because you don't have a business. You're not producing T2125. You managing your own finances is not considered for the CRA as self-employed. Okay. Uh, you're just managing your finances. That's all it is. Uh, so in that case, no, you're choosing not self-employed. It's as simple as that. Okay. It's not, it's not, the question is not directing your own investments. That's not what the question is. Do you have a business or not? Yes or no. The answer in your case is no. So, so simply say not self-employed. Okay. Uh, next question is from uh, Shara. Okay. Do we have to pay the amount received from CRA? What if they didn't receive any slips from CRA? By I'm amount, assuming what she got her mean? revenue. I'm Shara, <coughs> we, need to, we need for you to be a little bit more specific. Please. Yeah, if you could just add a few more details. What do you mean by the what amount exactly specifically are you talking about? Okay. Uh, Delta, she has a mm -hmm. question. Uh, does this year's U file have inputs for work for uh, work from home expenses due to COVID nineteen? 
Yes, absolutely. 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 It does. So hold on. Let's let's go through it. Let's try it. So I'm going to hide you for two seconds. No problem. Go ahead. That, and I will show you everybody in UFAL how to do it. So I'm hiding Ida. We're going to go ahead now and share my screen and we're going to have a look at it. All right. So here we go. Let's go back here and uh, let's show it in the stream and let's go over here. Here we go. So now when you are in UFAL to claim your, your, your home office expenses due to COVID-19, first you go to the interview setup. So as you see here, I click on the interview setup and then go to the section that's called employment expenses because home office expenses is considered an employment expense in the income tax act. Okay. So you go to the employment expenses, tick the box next to employment expenses right here, and then click next at the bottom of the page. So remember interview setup on the left-hand menu, tick the box next to employment expenses at the top right of the page to the right, click next. And then once you're there, okay, you will notice a new section in your left-hand menu called employment expenses. All right. So simply click on that section called employment expenses. And there's your first three options, which relate to home office expenses uh, due to COVID-19 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So like I mentioned before in the changes, you have the option of whether going with the flat rate method or whether going with the detailed method in this case. Okay. So you have the option between the three. Okay. So you have, so you have those options. So it's up to you to decide which one is more beneficial to you. Okay. Make the, make the calculation there. Simply click on one of those plus signs and go ahead and complete the form. So that's essentially how you do it. All right. So let's bring Ida back. And here we go. There you go. And I is back. And we could also mention that you did a uh, YouTube video for that, right? Absolutely right. So there's a YouTube video on our YouTube page. Okay. So simply look up UFile and go to our channel. Okay. So go to the, go to the UFile channel on YouTube. And when you go there, we have an instructional video on how to do essentially what I just showed now. Okay. So I say every step that I showed now is on our YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel as well. So go to YouTube, type in UFile, go to our channel and the video is going to be there. All right. Next question is from Belinda. Mm-hmm. I have a T4A for bursary for the exact amount of tuition. How do I claim that on my taxes? Is is the T4A taxable income? So it's ta it depends, okay, uh, whether it's taxable or not. If you were a full-time student in the current year, prior year, or this year right now, 2021, if you're a full-time student and you have that bursary, then uh, the bursary is tax exempt, meaning that the, it's not even taxable income. It won't show up on your return whatsoever. Okay. So once you enter the T4A and you file, and then you enter full-time months, okay, in, in your tuition fee area, then you file will exempt you completely. Okay. From, from it. Now, if you were a full-time student last year, or you are a full-time student, no, sorry, two years ago, 2019. And if you're a full-time student in 2021, you have to specify the U file that you were in one of those years, okay? And again, you'll see the option in the tuition area. It's going to give you that option. The moment you meet that criteria, tax exempt, it's, you, it won't even show up on your return. It's simply the, the income will not, will not be taxed at all. All right. Uh, next question is from Marcella. Her okay. first question, I am filing the first tax return and there is an amount owed. Mm -hmm. How can I print the tax return voucher to pay at the bank? It's not available to print. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the, the T7DRA, the T7DRA is not is not official. I'm I'm, I'm surprised at that. I um, haven't seen it in in the, I seen the for Quebec, I've mm -hmm. seen the Quebec one, but I haven't seen yeah, the federal one. But, I, but I'm pretty sure we have the federal one as well, and it is official. Uh, the Quebec one is not official, unfortunately, because Quebec does not allow it. It does not allow a software, mm -hmm. uh, a software designer to, uh, a, a tax software to do it. But I'm pretty sure on the federal it is. If not, uh, my listen, my, my suggestion to you is to go through uh, your online banking. That's your best bet. Uh, essentially, you know, add the CRA as a payee. It's going to ask you for your uh, SIN number in this case, and then just simply pay your bill that way. And you have a timestamp uh, specifically then. Okay. Her second question, how can I include my spouse as a dependent since I have been paying the bills at home for the whole year? It depends. What's your spouse's income for the year? 
Uh, that's, that's really what it depends on. If your spouse's income is below 13,000, then you could claim the spousal amount, uh, you know, below 13,000 and change. I can't remember exactly what it is. Uh, but as long as your spouse's income is below that, then you're fine. But if your spouse's income is above 13,000, it doesn't matter what bills you pay. Uh, it not the bills do not matter at all. Okay. The question is, what is the net income of your spouse during the year? If it's below 13,000, you claim spousal. If it's above 13,000, unfortunately, you cannot claim your spouse as a, as, a, as a dependent in this case. And we have to note that in the software, the spouse, you don't enter him in the, in the tab of dependent. He is a spouse, right? Yeah, he is a spouse. Exactly. But you could claim your spouse as dependent as long as their income is low enough, right? That's what the spousal amount credit is. So as long as their income is below 13,000, you could claim them. But if it's not below 13,000, nothing you could do. Uh, Anna? Use mm -hmm. I paid my kids on coding. How do I report that on my? Okay, so I'm assuming you you registered them for a course for uh, computer programming. Can yeah, you? Yeah, uh, it depends. Uh, <laughs> uh, that the answer is it depends. Is it a post secondary uh, educational institution? That's the question. You know, you understand. So if the school is, if whatever, uh, wherever you paid, wherever they got that education is considered by the CRA, a post-secondary educational institution, meaning like a university or a trade college or something along those lines, then they should admit to you a T22, uh, T2202. Okay. A slip. If it's not considered that, then unfortunately you can't claim it. It's not something that, that, that can be claimed. Okay. Um, Farhan. Mm-hmm. If you won't be owing anything to the CRA, would filing a tax return after April 30th lose anything such as GST credits or anything else if it doesn't matter uh, whether yeah. the, the file return is mm -hmm. on or before April 30th? So, uh, so okay, um, there's no penalty uh, if you file late and you have a refund. There's no penalty because the government owes you money. So the government's not going to penalize you for something that they owe you. Okay. So that, 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 that will never work. Okay. So, so if you don't owe money, if you have a refund coming your way and you file late, you're fine. Okay. You, you, you won't have a penalty, but you mentioned though, that benefit there. So for example, the GST credit, it is possible uh, that they will be late with those payments. Okay, it is possible that the government will be late sending you those payments. So that's why it's always recommended that you file on time. That way they could process those benefits quickly. The, another example is the Canada Child Benefit. Uh, so that gets paid in July, but it's based on your previous year's return. If they don't have that info, they can't proceed with the, with the July payments because they don't know what your income is. All right, uh, Karina. Mm -hmm. She said, uh, I'm wondering if for next year we can include the work from home expense due to COVID-19 from this year. No, you have to, it's going to be two separate claims. You're going to have a claim for 2020 and you're going to have a claim for 2021. So make your claim. If now. there is one, if there if is the, if one, if there is one, yeah, but chances are there is right. I mean, we're still working yeah, of from course. Home, right. So, um, well, chances are there will be. Karina, if you forgot and you received a notice of assessment, you could always uh, file an adjustment. Exactly. Or refile. Or you could do a refile as well, refile. right? The, the, those are your options, essentially. So, you, so essentially, you have to change or adjust your previous year. That's what you have to do, okay? So you can't save it for next year and accumulate it. That doesn't work. You're going to have to adjust your current year. Either you do it on the CRA My, My Account site or you just do a refile, okay, through UFile. Okay. Uh, Rafat has another question. Mm -hmm. When I decrease my business expense experience, this increases my refund. Increased child benefit. Any any explanation how I maximize this? When I decrease my business experience, I'm, I'm guessing income. I'm guessing your, your business uh, uh, income went expenses. low. No, because 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 your re hold on your refund increased and you increased your child benefit, which I'm assuming that means your net income went down. Uh, your net income was lower. Okay, so I'm assuming if your business income is lower, yes, uh, obviously your refund is going to go up because you paid less tax. Uh, you, you, sorry, you're declaring less income on your return. Yes, your child, ta your Canada child benefit will increase because your Canada child benefit is based on your net income. The less net income you have, the more Canada child benefit you you have. It's a progressive amount. Okay, so Canada child benefit, just like the GST, is a progressive amount. These benefits are based on your net income. The lower your income, the more the benefits you will collect. So that's, that's essentially how that works. I'm hoping I understood, uh, I understood the exactly. question. Yeah. Uh, Dina, Dina wants to know, do we provide courses for professionals such as personal or corporate income tax? 
Uh, we listen, we do offer courses for our other product, which is, uh, our professional product, which is DT max. And I'm the one, I'm the main person who gives those courses. Uh, so yes, we, we give it on several topics, but we, we center it more on the software itself. So for example, we offer a non-resident course. We explain that we explain all the tax incidences of non-residents. Uh, and then we show you how to produce it in the software, but that's only reserved for our professional product, which is DT max. Now I know we offer a UFile professional version as well which we call ufile pro uh but we don't offer courses there if you want to get those style courses you'd have to upgrade uh to dt max and we hope dina you could come on board with us to dt max and i could show you and, and i can and i could train you on 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 that software all right okay uh, next question is from jack yeah for the t77 sorry for the t776 rental property share of ownership is if other than 100 yeah. percent if it is 50 percent how should the expenses amounts be reported is it half i.e 50 percent for each spouse uh no what you do is if you specify to the software that your spouse is the partner and that you want to produce a rental statement automatically for them as well then you enter the total expenses and it's you file that will prorate the the expenses for you afterwards okay so there's no need to do the proration yourself manually the software will handle it as long as you specify to you file that your spouse is your partner in the rental statement he has a second question okay for foreign capital gains for personal property, mm -hmm. was a joint ownership with spouse? So should the amount be reported 100% or 50% of cost, et cetera? Yeah. Exchange rate to apply is 1.3415 and assumed to report amounts in U.S. funds, correct? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, yes, uh, it, it, that's a legal question. Okay. It's not a, it's not even a tax question. It's a purely, uh, it's a purely property uh, legal question. Okay. Uh, under uh, legally speaking, who was the owner of the property? If it's 50, 50 between you and your spouse, then you're declaring the capital gain at 50, 50. That's essentially what you're doing. Okay. The exchange rate. Yes. Whatever sale you have of the foreign property has to be reported in Canadian funds. All right. And you have a, yeah, and you have a choice as to what exchange rate you can use. You can either use the average annual rate from the bank of Canada, or you use the monthly rate, uh, the average monthly rate of the bank of Canada on the month that the property was sold. Okay. So you have the choice between the two. All right. But they, but, but the, the sale has to be reported in Canadian funds. Okay. Anya has another question. She wants to mm -hmm. know, does receiving the CERB or the CRB count towards the $13,000 limit uh, towards claiming one spouse as a dependent? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it does. Unfortunately, it's taxable income. So if you collected thirteen thousand, well, well, your spouse has now thirteen thousand dollars of income, which means that now you you essentially lose the spousal amount because they're going to basically get over the threshold of the basic personal amount. I think the total, I think the maximum was fourteen thousand. I think for the CRB, that's the maximum that somebody, if they claimed it from the beginning, you know, from mm -hmm. uh, mid March until I think it was uh, late September. I think it was when uh, I think something the like that. Yeah, when they sunsetted the program, uh, then yes, that amount counts. That amount counts for the spousal amount, unfortunately. It is it was taxable income. Okay, our next question is from Roy. <clears throat> All right. Okay, disability tax credit question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sibling A and B, C, disability person, are all living together. Okay. Okay, he must be yeah. a teacher. Okay, sibling <laughs> A has been claiming C, disability tax credit for the past uh, few years, years. Yeah. now sibling b never claiming before wants to claim the credit this year for 2020 because she has the higher income yeah how yeah. can sibling b claim the disability tax credit does he need to submit an, a new application form of the t2201 no. to the cra no they don't no because 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 a disability certificate does not specify who the caregiver is you decide who the caregiver is. Okay. You're going to decide with a tax return. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to claim sibling uh, B as the new caregiver essentially. So you don't need a new T22, uh, T2201. T Sorry. In our lingo, we always call it 2201, right? In the, in the tax lingo, but, but for every, for our people that are not in taxes, they don't understand what I'm saying. So I, it's a habit. I got to break, but, um, but essentially the T2201, T no, there's no need for a new one. Uh, what's called it? Because again, there's no requirement to name the caregiver on that form. So there's no need for a new one. All right. Um, Next question from David. Mm -hmm. 
I just noticed that my 2019 NOA notice of assessment shows I have unused net capital losses from previous years. Capital. Meanwhile, I have I had capital gains in 2019. How do yes, I refile yes. previous tax year to offset the capital losses? Okay, so I'm going to assume, David, that these were losses that were there prior to 2019. Okay, I'm going to assume because because if the losses were for 2019, then they would have been used up against the against the gain, and you still have them on your notice of assessment. So I'm assuming that uh, at the end of 2019. So I'm assuming that they were there before. Yes, you can refile. Absolutely. Uh, you you go ahead in the software. You make the you you input the losses that were that were there for the carry forward. Just make sure make sure you choose the appropriate year in UFAL because UFAL is going to ask you what year were those losses were those losses from. If you're not sure, the best thing to do is to go to the to go to the my account portal of the CRA. If the information should be there. All right. So once you do that, refile your return and claim your losses. Absolutely. You would have to adjust your return. Okay. Next question, Marcella. Mm -hmm. uh, she wants to know if the income as a babysitter should be reported as self-employed income. And two, does she need to report installment payments uh, on, on the tax return? Yeah. Okay. So number one, usually yes. Uh, so, so usually self-employment, where it gets a little tricky is if the babysitter is only working for one, uh, for one uh, uh, child. It gets a little tricky sometimes in that case because the CRA might consider that person as an employee because uh, when they when the CRA makes the distinction between employer and employee, okay, uh, usually an employer sets your schedule, okay, decides how you get paid, etc. And you might be considered an employee, but nine times out of ten, it's usually self-employed, okay, when it comes to uh, babysitting, all right. Unless, like I said, unless it's only one child that they're taking care of and the schedule is set by the parent then it might get tricky. Okay. So just, just giving you a heads up on that. Now the installments, absolutely. They have to be reported. And the only reason why you want to report them is because you're getting money back by claiming the installments on your return. Installments is a prepayment of your income tax for the year. Usually it's self-employed individuals that get charged installments because they don't pay any taxes at source on their income. So the government puts these individuals on installment plans so that they don't get the shock of having to pay lump sum a big income tax bill when they file their return. So the installments, you declare them to you declare them on your tax return to deduct them. They become a, re a refundable credit to tell the CRA, look, I've already paid taxes during the year. I'm not going to pay an extra, you know, I'm not going to pay more again. So usually they'll lead to a refund usually. So absolutely, you declare the installment payments. Absolutely. It it could lead to a refund or a reduce of any tax owing, right? Exactly. Either way, it's good news. You're reducing your tax bill because you're telling the CRA that you've already paid this tax ahead of time. You've already done it. Okay. You're not going to pay again a big lump sum amount. Um, John has a question. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if we're able to answer it because it's not really in our hands here. I, um, he submitted, he net filed his return with you file and he never received the confirmation or the NOA to his email. Okay. Uh, I logged into my CRA account and it said that I would receive a notice of assessment at the end of the first week of May. What went wrong? C contact the CRA, uh, John. I have no, that, that does not sound right to me. Uh, what's called, uh, that's not really on our end. We, we transmit it as long as you get a confirmation number, that means that the CRA has received it. Beyond that point, there's nothing that the software can do beyond that point. It's all in the CRA's hands. So contact the CRA and find out. Okay. However, the net file confirmation, it, you get it within the software itself. Mm. It's not emailed to you. No. So you no. should be able to go back in the software and see the, uh, that yeah. it's been transmitted. Exactly. Whether you're online or whether you're using the windows version, you're going to, the, the program is going to, is going to archive for you, your confirmation number. If you have that, that's a CRA acknowledging that they've received your file beyond that point. You have to deal with the CRA beyond that point. Okay, uh, Dustin, mm -hmm. uh, you file has only the option to add my 20 year old son who is a student as a dependent, but you told me that he's not a dependent. What should I do? No, you add them as a dependent. Yes. What I, what I'm saying is that you can't claim certain amounts related to dependents. Like for example, the eligible dependent amount, but for tuition, they become your dependent. Yes. Okay. So yes, you will add your, your, your 20 year old as a dependent and then the excess amount of tuition that, that your 20 year old is not claiming you file will transfer it over to your file. That's essentially how, how it'll work. Okay. Next question is from Jessica. 
For the T5008 in US funds, is it okay to you to use annual average exchange rate or daily exchange rate has to be used? Uh, you have the choice. You either go, it's not a daily, you either go with uh, annual or monthly. Those are your options, okay? That's what the CRA allows for you to do. And it's very, it's very easy to do. You simply go to Bank of Canada, type in average, annual, uh, average exchange rates, Bank of Canada. And you go there and they'll give them to you uh, and you'll find them directly. So it's, it's annual or monthly. Those are your options. Okay, our next question is from Jack. Uh, Jack. Why don't I... Ah, Jack, okay. All right. Okay. Foreign capital gains personal use property. What is income exempt under tax treaty? What is limit of foreign tax credit and deduction, the T2209? Okay, so foreign uh, capital gains, personal use, but what is income exempt under tax treaty? What is the limit of foreign tax credit? Okay, uh, good questions, Jack. Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a complex question. That, uh, for the question that I had earlier from the person who was asking for tax courses, I actually give a course on that for our, uh, for our professional product, which is DT Max, actually. I, I, I go into detail on that. So, uh, all right, foreign capital property, uh, uh, what's called that? What is the income exempt under tax treaty? What it means is, Canada has tax treaties with several countries in the world, okay? One of them being the U.S., of course, okay? That, that's one example. What these tax treaties lay out is that they will lay out if there's, what they'll do is that they'll indicate how each type of income is supposed to be taxed, okay, on your tax return, all right? That's what they lay out, all right? Now, the treaty will stipulate not only how they're taxed, but if there's an exemption for those incomes. The, the typical examples of these are pension income. Okay, so when you have a foreign pension income from another country, there are always exemptions for those pension incomes. A, a, a typical example of this is Social Security benefits from the U.S. So it's either 15% or 50% exempted in Canada. Okay, if, so for a Canadian who's receiving Social Security from the U.S., at the minimum, 15% of that income is exempt because of the tax treaty. The tax treaty stipulates what will be exempt and how the income is supposed to be taxed. So that's what a tax treaty does. Now, what is the limit of the foreign tax credit deduction? Your limit is essentially the tax that is otherwise payable for this income in Canada. Okay, so meaning if I've got $1,000 of foreign income, what would I pay in income tax in Canada for that $1,000? That becomes your limit. That becomes your ceiling. Okay, so that's essentially, and of course, any federal tax that you owe. So for example, if let's say you're not taxable, if you're not paying any federal income tax this year, well, of course, you've got no tax owing on that particular income. Therefore, your ta you have no foreign tax credit for that income. Okay, so, so the long story short of it is your limit as far as the foreign tax credit is the tax otherwise payable on this income in Canada. That's what it is. Okay, next question, Dina. Uh, how can I know that I am eligible for the new training, uh, the new training credit? Is it just no. shown uh, on the notice of assessment? Uh, yes. Uh, so you would have a limit that accumulated since 2019. So the way you would know is that in 2019, you would have to meet the eligibility criteria, which is that uh, you were a resident of Canada throughout the year. You are uh, at least 25 years old and less than 65 years old. Uh, you had earned income during the year, meaning you had working income, uh, self-employment income of at least $10,100 and more. I think in 2019, it was 10,000 only. Okay. And uh, you were a resident of Canada throughout the year and you didn't have uh, a net income that was above $150,000 a year. The moment, now that's a whole mouthful. Let me catch my breath. And the moment you meet all of that, there's more. No, I'm kidding. Actually, the moment you, you the moment you meet all of that, all of that criteria, no more, now you've just accumulated a limit for the next for the following year. Now, to claim the actual credit, you need tuition fees. You have to have had tuition fees during the year because the credit itself is limited to the lesser of 50% of your tuition fees or the limit you've accumulated up until that point. Okay, so that's that's your credit. And this, of course, UFAL carries forward automatically and will determine this automatically for you. If you're new to UFAL, if it's your first year filing with UFAL, you go to your notice of assessment. Okay, go to your notice of assessment or your My Account portal with a CRA, which will tell you what your limit is that you can plug into the software. Okay, Marcella wants to know, is it possible to send a tax return uh, to net file a return instead of mailing it if it's your first return? 
I believe it's not. Not for NetFile. Uh, if memory serves me for NetFile, if it's your first year, if it's an immigrant return, you're not allowed. You have to. No, hold on. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm wrong. Federally, you can. I'm sorry. I, I confused it with Quebec. Because uh, Quebec, if you have a Quebec return, you can't you can't transmit that one. Unfortunately, federally, I believe you can now. A first year return, you can net file. You're allowed to do it now. This is a couple of years ago, I believe. Uh, but in but if you have a Quebec return to file, that one is a paper file. Unfortunately, that one you cannot. I, I literally just did one actually. Okay, so. and if uh, and if this person has U file Pro and uses the e file, uh, same rule. Really same rule. Same same rule. Meaning that federally you can e file, but Quebec you cannot. Okay, it's okay. it's an exclusion on the Quebec side. Okay. Uh, next question from Pat. Mm -hmm. Can I still claim tuition for my two adult daughters? Mm -hmm. I live in Alberta. One is a student in Alberta, and the other is a student in Ontario. I was told that some provinces do not allow parents to claim tuitions anymore. Yeah, I believe I believe you're in uh, you're in Alberta though, so you're okay. Uh, you can claim, but yes, Ontario, for example, would be one example where you can't because yeah, provinces unfortunately are scrapping the credit. Don't ask me why. I don't know why they've done that, but a lot of provinces have done it and federal has also lessened the credit by re removing the textbook amount and the education amount, unfortunately as well. Uh, so in this case, yeah, you, you can still claim federally. You can, there's no issue there. You can take the excess amount that you, that, that your children, your daughters cannot get, can, do not need. Remember though, that your daughters have to use it first to lessen their tax to zero. And then once the, once there's an excess amount, they don't need, that's what you can recuperate in Alberta. You'll be okay. You should be able to claim uh, those tuition fees for Alberta as well. Uh, because I think Alberta is one of those provinces that still have it. If memory serves me. Uh, I believe Alberta still has it. Okay. Uh, Rifat mm -hmm. is asking, remaining tuition fees mm -hmm. not claimed by any parent. Can the child carry forward? Is it unlimited period? Yes. The answer is yes and yes. Uh, so the child, so if you, if the client, if the, if the parent is not claiming, uh, the excess tuition fees, then it gets carried forward by the child and the child can use them, uh, for a future year and it is unlimited. All right. So there's no, uh, there's no limit there. However, the government will, but, but unlimited is a relative term because the, because the way the tax return works is that you will be forced to claim them the moment you're, you're, the child gets taxable. Okay. The government will basically, the, you'll see it when you enter the carry forward schedule 11 will pop up automatically and claim the amount and you're required to claim it at that point. That's how it works. Okay. He's asking another question. Just a few. Yeah. Below. I see it. yeah. Uh, a spouse has few hundred income. Uh, why you file claims the medical expenses from this spouse, not on the higher income? Be okay, for a very simple reason. Your medical expense claim is reduced by 3% of your individual net income, meaning either yours or your spouse's. So in order to maximize the claim of medical expenses, we default the medical expenses to the lower income spouse because you can claim more of a credit because your three, your reduction of your medical expenses is less. Me, uh, so, so if your spouse has. Claim, and that's why we do that. Okay. And that's actually an optimization that Matt, mm -hmm. that you file does for you automatically, actually. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go back to Anya. Yep. Uh, she says it's her last question. That's okay, Anya. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. And how can one add their 2020 donation to their already submitted 2020 tax return? Okay, on the CRA. Yes. Uh, so, Anya, you, you answered your you answered your own question. I would put it in my account. That's the quickest way of doing it, to be honest with you. You could do a refile if you want. You could do that as well. So mm -hmm. you simply add the donation and then just refile your return. But in, in CRA, my account, you could do it very, very easily. You'll see it. It's going to be two columns. One is your the amount you declared, and then the, uh, on the side will be the new amount. You plug in your new amount. Make sure that you have your receipts handy in case the CRA asks you for them. And then just and then just submit through uh, through my account. Very simple, very easy to do. It got, whoever whoever is listening to us right now and does not have my account with CRA, get get it done. Just just sign up because you don't even need to create a user ID and passcode. You can use your user ID and passcode with your bank. They'll use what they call uh, the partner sign in ID, and it's great because you know if you're with uh, I'm with Royal Bank for example, I just log in with my Royal Bank account and I just go I go straight into my account. Very simply done. It's a great program. 
All right. Our next question is from Jack. Okay. Uh, my adult son has a disability and has been approved by the CRA for the disability mm -hmm. tax credit, but he cannot use it because his income is too yeah. low. Yeah. Can I claim him as a dependent if we were if we have supported him by providing housing at his at his own condo, sharing with his brother that we purchased? What about the caregiver credit? Uh, to me, the answer is yes to both. I know definitely the caregiver credit uh, you can claim. There's no requirement anymore, unlike past years. And I made that mistake. I remember one Facebook Live that a, that a, that a person corrected me on. Uh, uh, the caregiver game, there's no... Um, uh, there's no requirement to live there. And I don't believe there's a requirement there for the disability uh, tax credit uh, transfer either. You know, you're not required to live with them as long as you show that you, you're supporting that, that person as well. I don't believe you have to. I'll get back to it. I'll check, I'll check, the, uh, I'll check the folio in the meantime, uh, but I'm pretty sure you don't have to. Um, our next question is from Mary. It's a, okay. it's a question that I've seen before, okay. but thank you for asking. Can I add my dog medication on my tax return? The answer is no, unless it is a service dog. Okay, so if if the dog is a service, it doesn't have to be a, a blind service dog, right? Somebody for somebody who is legally blind. Okay, it could be uh, it could be also other types of service dogs as well. I know there's there's service dogs for people with epilepsy, right? Who have who have uh, mm -hmm. seizures. You know, there's also those dogs too. As long as it's a service dog, the answer is yes. If there is if it's not a service dog, then the answer is no. All right. Next question, Dina. Okay. If there is a healthy parent lives with, uh, no, if a healthy parent lives with her married daughter, can they add her to their tax as a dependent? Also, she has zero income. So any, de any dependent benefits can be claimed under the taxpayer. Okay. So a healthy parent with her married daughter. Okay. Theoretically, yes. Uh, but you would have to show uh, what's called an infirmity. Okay. So there has to be a, a note from a doctor on the federal side. You don't need a disability certificate. You don't have to go all the way to that point, but you do need a note from a doctor that specifies that the person has an infirmity, some sort of difficulty that they need to live uh, with their daughter. Okay. So you would need that in Quebec, as long as they're 70 and above, if you live in Quebec, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if Dina, you live in Quebec, but in Quebec, you don't need, you don't even need that. As long as your parent is 70 and above and they live with you for at least 365 consecutive days of which half of those days are in the current year, which would be 2020. Then you could claim your parent for uh, the caregiver amount in Quebec. You don't need a certificate. You don't need a, an infirmity, but on the federal side, you absolutely need an infirmity. You have no choice. A note from a doctor that specifies that they have some sort of difficulties and that, and that, and that's the reason why they're living uh, with their child. Uh, uh, Dina said she's from Alberta. Ah, okay. So forget, forget what I just said for Quebec. Uh, so, so again, for federal, you do need an infirmity. Okay. You, uh, you absolutely need an infirmity in this case. Okay. Our next question is from Jessica. Okay. So let's go here. Okay. Right. How to report skip the dishes vehicle expense. Is there a simplified method per like a per kilometer uh, uh, vehicle allowance? Not, no, not really. Not because you're self-employed. Uh, in this case, you're self-employed. So it's not like a moving expense where the government allows you a simplified method uh, or a truck driver, for example, they were, they were also allowed a simplified method. Unfortunately, no, uh, you would have to basically, you know, keep all your receipts and make sure that everything's there in order and you make your claim. Okay. Philippe is asking, should I and my wife file a T776 forms for the same property or or one of us and include 50% ownership? Okay, I'm assuming that you're, you're, you're you have ownership of this rental property 50-50. Uh, should I, should, yeah, both of you need to file T776s, but you could have you file produce it in your spouse's file. So you don't need to reproduce the 776 in your spouse's file. In your file, you specify that your spouse is the partner and you specify to you file that you want to generate the same statement in your spouse's file. And then you file will simply generate it automatically in your spouse's file. So that way you, it prevents you from doing, you know, double the work essentially to produce those forms. All right, uh, Shadi, mm -hmm. if I have a T5008 with US uh, funds, dollar amount, I have to convert the amount to Canadian or yeah. if select USD in the, T, in the form T5008, mm -hmm. the software will do that for me. Um, to my memory, to my knowledge, the software won't do it. Uh, you would have to convert it 
yourself uh, in the software. The software does not have an automatic exchange conversion uh, within it. So I would recommend that you do it yourself. Okay, next question is from Ben. Mm -hmm. How do I enter small amount of income uh, and had income tax deducted, but company did not issue T4 because of low dollar value? Uh, you, you would reproduce it in a T4 again, uh, that that's where you would put it because you need to enter the income tax deducted. So put in your, uh, I'm assuming you're probably below, uh, you're probably in the exemption levels of CPP and EI. That's why probably you don't have any contributions there. Uh, but if you have tax withheld at source then you, you, you create a T4, even if there is one, if, if there isn't, you plug in your box 14 for your income and you plug in box 22 for the tax withheld at source. That's what you would have to do. Okay, our next question is from Ava. Okay. What should I do if I forgot to enter a rental property asset class A, 20% uh, SL depreciation in the U file CCA schedule that was purchased in 2013? You would have to do an adjustment, and that would have to be a manual adjustment. Uh, you, you cannot do a refile for something like that. The government will, will not understand the difference between the two. Uh, so you would have to reproduce your – it's a rental, you said, right? So, so you would have to reproduce a T776. You would have to print it off, and you have to print it with an adjustment form, with a T180J. Uh, and, and within the T180J, there's an explanation. There's a box to explain, and you specify that you had not included the uh, class – a depreciable property in the previous year or in the current year, and you are now declaring it with this adjustment. That's what you'd have to do. This, this would have to be a paper adjustment. It's a little more complex than just a donation that's missing or a medical that's, that's missing. It's a little more complex. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't have any new questions. I'm just double checking to make sure I didn't forget anybody. Uh, anything you want to add or... Um, remind our uh, listeners um so i let, you know remember that you know to remind everybody that uh, the deadline has not changed especially on the federal side okay that you really do need uh you really do need in this case to uh, uh submit your tax turn on time which is tomorrow at midnight you have to be able to submit it and then we're talking about net file right if you net file by tomorrow uh, at midnight you're fine okay by by midnight you are fine okay you don't have any problems quebec is going to turn a blind eye the deadline is still april 30th but they will turn a blind eye till may 30th that's essentially what they've announced that they will give you that kind of grace uh, for those of you who received COVID related benefits, such as the CERB or the CRB or employment insurance, like sick leave, for example. Okay. Uh, if you owe money, uh, if you owe money, uh, the government will give you an interest holiday. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll give you an interest holiday up till the 30th of April, 2022. So effectively you've got a year to pay them back essentially without any, you know, extra charges, uh, and without any extra charges. Uh, now, remember that the criteria also is that you can't have an, uh, a taxable income that's above $75,000 to be to be eligible for that interest holiday, okay? Just just, uh, just to mention that as well. Um, uh, you know, so now the other thing I want to mention is that a lot of what we answered today uh, and what I showed on the screen as well is found on our website as well. So don't hesitate to go to ufile.ca, okay? So when you are on our website on ufile.ca, you will notice uh, some tabs at the top. Okay, so let me actually just share that with everybody since there's the, there's not a lot of questions. Give me a second item. One more, you. but uh, you can. Yeah. Two. All right, so I'm just going to hide you for two seconds and just show everybody our website and uh, and what we do uh, and what we do on our website here. Oops, no. Uh, hold on, entire screen. All right, so if we go here, let me go back. Let me go back. Uh, show in stream, show it this way. And now we get that little loop-de-loop -loop there. All right. So here's our website. So don't hesitate to go to tips and tools. You have two really great tabs here. You file tax and you, where we answer a lot of, you know, frequently asked questions, uh, on, and we also have our, our YouTube videos that are directly there as well. Okay. We do have a podcast as well. Uh, if you go, if you go to SoundCloud, if you go to uh, Apple music, or if you go to uh, Google podcast, we do record one every two weeks on various tax topics that are really interesting, uh, as well. Uh, don't hesitate as well to go to our blog. So tips and tools, we have a UFAL blog where we write again, general interest, uh, stories 
uh, general interest stories here uh, on uh, on taxation uh, in general. We just added this one here, tax efficient cash for in trying times. It's a nice little article. We're going to do a podcast on this as well. Okay, don't hesitate. We also have our YouTube page. Okay, so if you go to our YouTube page over here uh, and you type in uh, with you file, so um, you go directly to our official to our official channel over here, YouTube. We have a bunch of videos there. Don't hesitate to go through there. And we have all our podcasts as well that you can, that you can view directly there and some how-to videos on UFAL as well. All right, so let me stop sharing my screen. Let's bring in Ida. And uh, here we go. All right, Ida's back. Okay. So Next. we just have a few, we have a few last mm -hmm. questions. So Dina wants to know, she noticed that in you filed the home office expense, it asks for a portion, a percentage of the home yeah. that is used for personal purposes. How does that work? Uh, is that how it works? So basically what you're entering is, uh, it's, it's the percentage that I mentioned before. Okay. So essentially what you're indicating is what's the square footage of the, of the home office divided by the square footage of the, of your entire home. Okay. Whatever percentage you get there, you enter the opposite basically in, in that, in that thing. So if it's 10%, uh, that, that represents your home office, you're entering 90% in the software. So you're saying that 90% of your home is used for personal reasons for personal usage and 10% is used for your work. Okay. And by doing that, you enter the total expenses under your detailed method and you file will prorate, uh, your eligible expenses automatically. Okay. That's essentially how that works. Okay. Uh, Farhan. Uh -huh. If there is time, my question is not directly related to tax. However, what should one put their occupation as if not employed nor self-employed and just manage their personal investment portfolio when applying for a credit card to keep it simple? Oh, that's uh, for hand. It's a good <laughs> question. <kind> of <laughs> yeah, that one I'm not sure. I'm gonna be honest with you for hand because uh, you're talking about, for example, when you're going for a loan, for example, or you know, at a bank or something like that. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I'm gonna be honest with you for hand. I'm not sure. I mean, you're theoretically retired. To be honest with you, that that's essentially what you're considered. Uh, it would be it would be retired essentially because you're living off your investments, which is you know unless I care ourselves. If you're living off your RSP, your RSP is in investments, right? The only thing that the RSP is that is that you register them with the government and they're tax sheltered. That's the only difference, you know. Uh, so beyond that, yeah, th that's all I could really think off the top of my head there for that one. <laughs> all right. Next question is from Ava. Are there any specific things to keep in mind when selling a rental property in BC? And I am uh, Alberta, Alberta resident. resident. No, not necessarily. Uh, there's nothing specific to mention. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to produce, for example, a BC return for your rental sale. Okay. There's no, there's no need for that. You simply sell the property. You indicate the sale, you pay the cat. You, you're, you're obviously going to have a capital gain. You're very likely going to have a capital gain to declare on your tax turn and maybe some rental income to declare as well. And maybe a recapture as well, depending if you depreciated your property or not. It all depends on that, you know? So no, there's nothing unique uh, I, I, from the fact that it's in BC. Now, if you had a business in BC, that's different. Then you would have to file what we call a multi-jurisdiction return. And then you would have to pay a portion of your, ta of your provincial tax to BC and a portion of your provincial tax to Alberta. Okay. But for rental, that doesn't count because that's considered property income to the, ta to the income tax act. And you just stay within your province. Okay. Our next question is from Ra uh, Rafa. Yeah. Rafat, sorry. I mm -hmm. sold a rental property, which was before a principal resi residence. What should I prepare as a proof of market value at the switch time from the principal to rental? Uh, normally you would need something assessed by an evaluator. So you either, uh, uh, you know, a, a real estate broker, uh, or, you know, an evaluator, that's what you would need essentially, uh, to, to be able to establish that value at the time when the switch happened, because you have a change of use basically is what you have. The technical term or what you, what you have, there's a change of use, uh, change in use. Sorry. Uh, so at that point you would need some sort of like a certified evaluator of properties to be able to evaluate, you know, to, to indicate what the market value of that property is. Uh, Ava is asking next question. Okay. So just give uh, a second here. Yep. Okay. For rental property, how do you determine what is operating expenses versus capital expense? Ah, that's a very good, that's, that's a very that's, good question. That's a very good question. Actually on our professional site, we actually have a, a nice uh, blog article on that. Actually, you know what I'll post it. I'll post it in the chat as well. Uh, but basically uh, there, there's several factors. I'm actually going to, to my own article because it's, it's, it's a really good one. <laughs> 
it's a it's a really good article that explains it. There are, there are several factors. There's no one factor that determines it. So I'm just going there now, and I'll tell you guys in a second. And I'll post I'll post the link. Uh, I'll post the link on um, uh, you know in in the chat. So just give me one second to get there. Um, so here we go. Capital versus current expenditures. All right. So there's several of them. So so some of them are enduring benefit. So for example, is whatever work you are doing there going to last a long time? Uh, or is it just something like this, a little patchwork that you're doing uh, to the building? So for example, you know, when you're changing the roof, that's an enduring benefit. Okay. But when you're fixing the toilet, you know, yes, it's an enduring benefit, but it's, it's small, uh, it's small, relatively speaking. Uh, is it a maintenance or is it capital improvement? Was something broken when you fixed it in the renovation or are you just improving what's already there? Okay, so if if it's an improvement, it's a cap, it's capital in nature. Uh, if it's a repair, it is a current expenditure in that case. Now, other uh, other ones are relative value as well. So, is the work being done, you know, a, a high value relative to the to the entire property? For example, if I'm rebricking an entire side of my house, well, that's got a big value relative, relative to my to my entire property. So that becomes capital in nature. But if it's a small repair, like for example, the toilet that I just fixed, well, then in that in that case, it's it's very likely uh, a current expenditure. Okay, so these are and then other factors are. Uh, whether you are anticipating selling the property, okay, and whether you are readying it for rental use, for example, okay? Uh, so if, for example, you make the renovations to sell the property, then it's capital in nature again. So all these have to be taken. There's no one factor that will decide it. It's usually going to be a, an accumulation of, fact, of all these factors that will decide it. And what I'll do is, since I'm already there, let me post, uh, I'll post the link here from our professional blog. All right, so this is this is a link that comes directly from our uh, professional blog, which you have there, which now should show up, I'm hoping. I don't know if anybody sees it right now. Yeah, there it is. Okay, and that's from our, our professional site, which, which explains all of what I just mentioned now. Okay, and it's a pretty good article. I read it too. So uh, our next question, and I believe it may be our last one. I don't see anything after Lynn's. Okay. So Lynn? Mm-hmm. I work from home from my employer due to COVID, but I also have a home business that I started in June. Mm. How do I determine uh, home office expenses? You determine it as a percentage of your time. So if you worked 10 hours during the day, okay, standard, all right, be, with your, between your business and your employment, what's the percentage of those hours that you worked for your home, for, for your employer, and what's the percentage that you worked for your home business? So what you do is at first grab your expenses, Okay, you know, accumulate all your home office expenses and then multiply them by the percentage of the time that you dedicate to each to each side. And then once you have that amount, then you do the second proration based on uh, the square footage of your home office. Okay, that's essentially how you would determine it. So it's on the time that you dedicate per, on a standard week between each one. Okay, um, our hour is up. We don't mm -hmm. have any new questions at the, right now, so... Uh, I think we can conclude it here. Yep. Thank you very much, Jerry, for all the Facebook Lives uh, and answering everybody's questions. Yep. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Ida, uh, for being the co-host and uh, get, having everything run smoothly for me as I'm going as we're going along <laughs> in this thing. Yeah, well, it, it wasn't easy, you know, working from home. Sometimes, you know, you get into these technical issues, but uh, yep. it, it was smooth. Mm -hmm today so uh don't forget yep. tax deadline april 30th very yep. important if you owe yep. money you don't want to pay penalties so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, any last words of wisdom from you listen i uh like i said just to, just uh just make sure that you file on time. You have till midnight tomorrow to file. You could do it through net file. You don't have to mail it. Uh, I think, I think honestly, mailing a tax return is, is really going to become, uh, I think the government will, will practically require us to, to electronically file soon at the rate that it's going. Uh, yeah. And this pandemic just, just, you know, accelerates that. Right. I mean, because of course, of course, be, because we just can't, you know? Uh, so at that point, that's what I would suggest to everybody. For those of you who have not filed your tax return yet, don't panic. Okay. You still got a bit of time. You got today and tomorrow mm -hmm. and you got all of tomorrow. Just make sure when you're filing your return the trick that i give to everybody uh, when they're filing their tax return when they're starting and this you can use it for next year for those of you who, who are listening to us who have already filed this have handy a copy of your previous year's tax return 
uh, next to you while you are producing your return. This is particularly handy because you could check to see whether you whether you missed anything on your tax turn. Most of our tax turns don't change, okay, from one year to the next, especially the type of information that we input from one year to the next. So it's very important to have that next to you. Have your notice of assessment next to you as well. We mentioned before about carry for. I answered a question about carry forwards before. Mm -hmm. That's crucially important. Your notice of assessment has those carry forwards, which you can use to reduce your tax bill today. Okay. So make sure that you have that as well handy when you are producing your tax return. So these are some of the little tips and tricks that you could use. Okay. One last question from Lorna. Okay. In a rental property, if, if I carry the mortgage, how do I determine what I have to claim as interest? Uh, look at your bank statement. Your bank should send you uh, whether it's quarterly or whether it's yearly, they should send you a, a, a document that explains from all the payments that you made during the year or in that quarter, what constitutes interest and what constitutes principal. Okay. And you grab the interest amount and that becomes your expense. You could even, you could probably see that as well in your bank account online. I'm sure if you go online, you could see it directly there as well. So the government, uh, not the government, excuse me, your, your financial institution uh, that you did, that you did the mortgage with should produce a statement that shows you uh, the difference between the, you know, that shows you basically what you paid. All right. So I think this is it for uh, this tax season. So yep. thank you very much. It was uh, a very busy tax season. I got to admit, uh, COVID did not make things easy. Yep. So unfortunately, uh, yeah, that's it. All so right. thank you very much. So have a good afternoon, everybody. And don't forget to file on time. All right. So take care, All everybody. Right. Take, take care. Everybody. All right. Bye-bye.